Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, Godzilla is back and proves himself to be the king of the monsters. A group of eco-terrorists led by Charles Dance's Alan Jonah store facility belonging to monster trucking agency Monarch and kidnap Dr. Emma Russell, played by Vera Farmiga, and her daughter Madison, played by Millie Bobby Brown, taking with them Emma's device, the Orca, a frequency transmitter that can control the Titan's behavior. Monarch scientists, including Ken Watanabe's Ashiro Serizawa and Sally Hawkins' Vivian Graham, hire Emma's estranged husband Mark, played by Carl Chandler, to lead a team to help find his family and the missing Orca. Monarch soon discover Jonah and his men plan to use the Orca to awaken the sleeping titans around the world, starting with Monster Zero, Ghidorah, to restore the world to its natural balance, and the only one who can face the threat is Godzilla. The old Big G has been smashing his way through cities since 1954, and has rarely stopped since, launching a hugely successful franchise where he smacks around other kaiju. Of course, they have this most recent entry comes from the 1956 US re-air of the original Japanese film that had Raymond Burr paced into it for Western audiences. That's one of many attempts over the years to Americanize the big guy. Of course, the most notorious was Roland Emmerich's failed attempt in 1998 that was pretty much hated by fans, critics, and audiences alike. But the most successful was in 2014, when Legendary launched their Monsterverse with Gareth Edwards' Godzilla, who at the time was hot off his indie success, Monsters, and has gone on to have Kong Skull Island, which I actually quite enjoyed in a trashy, exploitative way, and is building up towards next year's Godzilla vs. Kong. And I actually re-watched Gareth Edwards' Godzilla for the purpose of this review, and I have to admit that my opinion on it hasn't really changed since I first saw it. It's just a strangely unsatisfying movie. It's certainly a film that has polarised audiences, and many Godzilla fans don't really like that movie very much because it doesn't actually have that much of the big G in it, which is a valid complaint, but there is actually quite a bit of monster action in it on reflection. It's just that a lot of it is scaled at human level, which is interesting, but also incredibly frustrating at points, particularly the time jumps in that film where they set up a big set piece and then they'll jarringly cut away and you'll only see the end of it being displayed on TV screens, which may or may not have been a problem had it not been for the fact that a lot of the characters in that movie are pretty boring. Aaron Taylor Johnson is especially a big issue. And so Gareth Edwards has not returned for this sequel. In fact, he hasn't done anything since Rogue One. And taking his place here is Michael Doherty, who is a horror director best known for Trick or Treat and Krampus. And I'd like to say that this film is a bigger, better improvement on the previous entry. But you know what? I think I'll take Edward's film over this one because this is a shambling mess of a movie. Rarely have I seen a big budget movie so stunningly incoherent as Godzilla, King of the Monsters. This is a ridiculously overstuffed film on several different levels, which you think for a kaiju movie would be a good thing, but trust me, having sat through it, it's hard to know where to even begin with all the problems. In fact, it's hard to process it. The film is such a two hour plus bombardment that I genuinely have a hard time actually keeping track of what happened in it at points. So I guess the best place to begin is with the plot and the characters. And I know immediately what you're going to say, well no one watches a Godzilla movie for the humans, which I feel is a faulty argument. Yeah, that may have held water back in the 50s and in the 80s when Raymond Burr did some cheap inserts into a Japanese film. But you know what? These movies deliberately sought out acclaimed award-winning actors. That was something that Gareth Edwards very deliberately sought out in his movie. He wanted to add a human element through the casting. Thus, you had people like Juliette Binoche, Brian Cranston, David Strathairn, Elizabeth Olsen, and so on and so forth. Of course, those characters were still largely dull, boring, and a total waste of that cast in many instances. No doubt about it. But if you thought those characters were bad in the last movie, it's way 
way, way worse here. There's no one like Brian Cranston in the previous film that elevates the material in any way. There's no one where when they get killed off, they go, oh man, I wish that character was the lead instead. No, everyone here is terrible. And that really does hurt to say, because unlike so many of the actors in this film, on paper, this is an amazing cast, but man oh man are they misused here. And the core of the film is meant to be this fractured family that has been divided ever since San Francisco. They lost their son in the events of the previous film, and so the two parents have now gone their separate ways, and they have very different opinions over Kaiju, and their daughter is in the middle. All three of these actors are really talented performers. Kyle Chandler is a great fit for the lead of this kind of film, because he has that B-movie matinee idol appearance to him, which is exactly what he was cast as in Peter Jackson's King Kong. Vera Farmiga, great character actor. And of course, we already know how good Millie Bobby Brown is from Stranger Things. But even they can't bring this to life. This is supposed to be the emotional core of the film. This is supposed to be the thing that we keep invested in on a human level, and we don't care about it one iota. They're barely in scenes together. Most of the time, they're conversing over video calls. And so we get no sense of what has actually been lost, aside from a couple of brief flashbacks, they're pretty much in two separate movies for almost the majority of the running time, so that falls flat. There's also the fact that these characters, like almost the entirety of the cast, are written entirely contradictory from scene to scene. So Chandler's character is set up as being extremely hostile about the Titans. He wants them to kill them all because that's how he's built up the resentment from losing his son. Except in the next scene that he's in, he goes, well, how about we open the shield door so we can get a look at Godzilla? Yeah, that makes sense for him to say as a character. But Vera Farmiga gets it way worse because her character makes no sense whatsoever. She gets a big speech in the middle of the film where she has to explain her character's beliefs, her motivations, her reasons for doing things, which is so illogical and so inherently contradictory that you can feel Farmiga having to contort herself to try and make it in any way plausible or credible for her character to say, which pretty much sums up her performance across the entirety of the movie. And then you have Millie Bobby Brown, who pretty much doesn't do anything aside from just stand around waiting for the climax so she can run headfirst into danger and utter the word shit several times. It's her first line, and that's pretty much all she's given to do here. If I was to list all the cast members that get the short shrift here, it'd pretty much be the cast list. That includes the returning cast members from the previous Godzilla movie, notably the Monarch members of Ken Watanabe and Sally Hawkins, who are great, soulful actors, but are relegated again to exposition duty. Watanabe does have the best acted moments in the film, but mostly all he has to do is deliver more exposition, because the film has to set up all the world building about the monsterverse, about Monarch, and about Kong Skull Island. So every so often, they'll throw in, oh, Kong, or Skull Island, into the dialogue to just wake you up a little bit. But man, oh man, Hawkins especially is very ill-served by this film. I hope that now she's won an Oscar, she doesn't have to do any more films like this ever again. But they're not even the worst served in terms of returnees. David Strathairn also comes back, but he might as well not have bothered because he's only in two scenes, one of which has dialogue, and that's conveyed through a video call. He sets up a key plot point in the middle, and then after that's done, he's just not in the movie anymore. Bye! I guess that was total contractual obligation on his part. Even the newcomers get nothing. O'Shea Jackson Jr. is pretty much just playing a military type, so all he does is bark orders. Tom Thomas Milditch is woeful comic relief, reciting lines that are apparently written by a robot. At one point he has a Michael Bay-esque gag where he compares Ghidorah's name to gonorrhea. Hardy ha ha. And this is a stunningly overqualified cast that is pretty much just shuttled from control room to control room. They might be in a secret base, they might be on an airship, but you know what? None of it matters because all they're doing is just going to different places that have computer monitors that they can read things 
things off of. And at that point, why even bother hiring so much name talent? You might as well just hire a bunch of C-listers and you'd have exactly the same effect. And I know this movie is meant to be a vessel for monster fights that just ferries us from location to location to location, but it doesn't even do a good job of that. To give an idea of how cluttered and convoluted this film is, you only have to look at Z.E. Zhang's character, who is a monarch scientist, who turns out to have a twin sister. If this detail escaped you having watched the film, you're not alone, because I didn't realise it whilst I was watching it. It turns out that the character was in two different places, and because the film hops around the globe so much, I didn't even realise it. They only very briefly mention that she has a twin in the first place, and the twin is only in, I think, one scene of the movie anyway. It's almost like they wrote themselves into a corner because they wanted the character in a specific place at a specific moment, but then they realised, oh, she's on the airship at that time. I guess she has a twin now, which just speaks volumes about the movie. And in that very same scene, Joe Morton also turns up playing a surviving member of Kong Skull Island, but you would never know that because the movie never mentions it at all, and he only appears in that one very small scene. Like, what is even the point of that? And frankly, the last time I saw a movie that was such a gibbering, frenzied, frantic catastrophe like this, it was Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. But I know what you're probably thinking, I don't care about that, I care about the kaiju battles, that's what I came here to see. Well even that is a letdown. It seems like Michael Doherty, given a huge budget for the first time, just lost any self-restraint alongside it. I liked Krampus, but this is a filmmaker out of control. I know he's a Godzilla fan, but you can't do all of them at the same time, which is what this is, because it basically ends up as a load of fan service references strung together instead of anything structured. The movie ends up collapsing on its own excess, and the fight scenes are often very hard to see. I mean, the camera is so close for starters. You you rarely get a wide shot, it's all covered in mediums and close-ups and the camera's often shaking or moving with the monsters and so you're just trying to work out which scaly thing is which and often the atmospheric weather conditions are hindering you even more. It's clear when they were conceiving the fight scenes and the action sequences they were really going for something visually striking and beautiful. They mentioned how they wanted the fight scenes to look like paintings, they wanted to have that epic feel to them. The result, though, is a movie that seems to have been processed and calculated to within an inch of its life. It is so busy on screen that it is hard to focus on any of it at all. There is so much snow and rain in this film. One of the major fight scenes is in Antarctica in the middle of a blizzard which doesn't really serve a big monster battle as you would expect and the final fight scene in Boston has so much rain in it it seems to be competing with the Roland Emmerich Godzilla so that's in your way and then on top of that there's thunder and lightning almost constantly whenever Ghidorah's on screen and so that's always distracting you and all that flashing becomes very irritating, if not headache inducing, frankly. If you have photosensitive epilepsy, I cannot stress enough, do not go and see this film. About a third of the running time seems to be set in these conditions, and that includes control room scenes where they start blinking the lights on off to simulate something actually happening in those moments. It's really obnoxious, frankly. And you compare the fight scenes in this movie to something like Pacific Rim, Guillermo del Toro knows how to stage his kaiju you fight. You always kept the camera back, you always made sure you knew exactly where you were, he allows you to take in all the detail. It worked in that movie and by comparison King of the Monsters looks over designed, over processed and overdone in every conceivable level. Yes, there are occasionally moments that do look really impressive, especially when they finally pull out for wide shots, particularly the birth of Mothra. There's some great isolated moments, but for the vast majority, I have never seen a movie so strive for beauty so often and look so ugly. It's like the filmmakers were trying to measure people's enjoyment in decibels. 
songs and it quickly becomes very, very repetitive. I tired of it so quickly and the amount of destruction becomes so fast cool, so excessive that actually you start tuning it out after a while. It simply becomes white noise. And what makes this worse is that Gareth Edwards' film, for all its faults, did a really good job portraying just how terrifying and how devastating a kaiju battle would be. And you see the human cost of it. You see that at the end of the movie where he goes into the football stadium and there's all those displaced families trying to reconnect with each other. And this movie tries to run with that at first because it sets it up as being like a 9-11 style event. But then the movie totally forgets about that once all the monsters monster smashing goes on because there are 17 different monsters that unleashed during the course of this film. So that means there's about 17 different monsters smashing up capital cities, but the movie never thinks about that in terms of total devastation. We see these play out on TV screens over the course of the film, but otherwise the movie never pays any mind to that whatsoever. In fact, for all the enormity of what's going on, considering it's so cataclysmic and so appalling apocalyptic, it only seems to have a cast of about 20 people. It feels strangely small. And even worse, the destruction gets to such a point where you go, what are these guys even fighting for anymore? It's just pretty much destroyed the world as we know it. And Godzilla himself is again an afterthought in this movie, which is a strange thing because that was such a common criticism of the previous movie. You would think that they would amplify Godzilla to the maximum here, but instead he doesn't really enter the film until maybe about 30, 40 minutes in, and again, only every so often. In fact, he sits out almost the entirety of the second act. And again, it's sort of like Optimus Prime in the Transformers movies. He's mostly there for the hero shots. Everything else in the plot is relegated to the humans. And making this worse is just how bad the film is on a thematic level. The film tries to preempt the complaints about the massive destruction here by saying, oh, well, the places where the kaiju fights have been rejuvenated by the radiation, they're going back to nature. And we see this in Las Vegas and San Francisco. Cisco, and this is just absolute hogwash. I guess kaiju fights are a really good thing now. This is particularly egregious when the human characters have to make a major saving throw over the course of the narrative, and what they need to do is to use a nuclear bomb. That's right, you heard me correctly. The human characters need to use a nuclear bomb in a Godzilla movie. You know, the character that was originally created as a metaphor for man's hubris and the bombing of Hiroshima. Seriously! And this movie has an environmental message which is staggeringly awful in its implications. So the eco-terrorist plan, who I'll remind you are the villains of the movie, is that they're going to release all the titans on the planet to destroy man's major cities and restore the Earth to its natural order. Because you see, we humans are the real monsters. We're polluting the planet. The kaiju are simply reclaiming what once belonged to them. That's how they reason it. And you would think that the inherent problem with that plan pointed out in the film would be the displacement of billions of people, as well as countless lives being lost in the course of that destruction. But as it turns out, over the course of the film, that wasn't really the flaw in their plan. No, the problem was they chose Ghidorah to be the MC, to be the king of the monsters, to rule over the rest of them, because you see, that's a monster alien. He's not natural. That's why everything goes to hell. If they just destroyed cities with Godzilla leading the way, it would have been totally hunky-dory because as we learn from this film it turns out that's just rejuvenating and positive when you destroy a city. Yes that really is the message the film seems to impart. It's not just stupid it's nihilistic as well and I like a good environmental message but you're not supposed to side with the extremist characters and also the movie is so glib and cavalier about the destruction in the first place. Towards the end of the movie 
city when something is about to explode in Boston. One of the characters jokes, it's going to be a bad day to be a Red Sox fan. Ha ha ha, Boston's about to be turned into a cinder. So yeah, I really didn't like Godzilla King of the Monsters and all I asked for was just something fun. And instead I got something that was stupid and brainless in the worst possible ways and a total waste of resources. I think this is a noisy, repetitive movie and frankly I couldn't wait for it to be over because I had a splitting headache. If you're a hardcore kaiju fan that loves monsters smashing through cities no matter what, you might get some thrills out of this film, but for me, I really, really hated it. In fact, it was such a negative experience for me that actually I'm starting to look back a lot more fondly on the Roland Emmerich Godzilla. Yeah. It's that bad. Godzilla King of the Monsters is a hulking mess of a film that manages to make a monster mash stupendously boring. An all-star cast are thoroughly wasted as the film reduces them to little more than people reading exposition off computer screens when not trying to get squashed or behaving in erratic, contradictory ways for the sake of the plot. It doesn't even satisfy as a pure smash up because director Michael Doherty has apparently lost any restraint whatsoever, making virtually every scene frantically busy to the point where it's genuinely hard to see what is happening. The fight sequences are often filmed too close to the beast, they're frequently obscured by rain and snow, and near constant thunder and flashing, strobing effects. There are the odd moments of genuine awe, but this is an ugly, repetitive, numbing film that just piles on destruction while adding a genuinely bewildering environmental message that apparently sides with the film's villains. Leaving aside that Godzilla is still a side character in his own film, this pummels the audience into submission, and not in a good way. If you like this review, then you can smash away over over to my Patreon, where you can see my reviews early among other perks, including access to my Discord server. But until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.